My name is Elias, and I'm uh, beginning my third year of PhD studies at KTH in a research field that is called industrial ecology. Uh, that's basically the study of material and energy flows in our society. And I apply the, our usual methods like life cycle assessment and system analysis to biochar, which is my research topic. I'm, I'm looking at biochar in Sweden and how it can be integrated to our local um, economy and industry. So since 2017, I've been following kind of all the activities happening in, in, in Sweden related to biochar. Uh, and that's why I thought that I would divide my talk in two parts. Uh, first, a part where I will present to you what is happening here, because you may not know about the Swedish current projects. And that will be a non-technical presentation, more of general interest. And, and then in the second part, I will tell you about uh, life cycle assessment and the result of my research work. So let's start with uh, the biochar deployment. Um, the big picture, as you know, is that by the end of the century, we are supposed to develop capacity to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere to mitigate our residual emissions in order to get, reach, the, for instance, the Paris Agreement. But how much we will need of this uh, negative emission, which are here, depend, of course, on the pathway we will take. If we go for slow decarbonization and large residual emissions, we will need more CDR, and maybe we'll need less if we are more efficient at decarbonizing the economy. Uh, but my point here is that Sweden, at the country has set uh, very ambitious political goals and the industry is pushing to be among the first ones to have large scale negative emissions, which includes biochar. So that's why we have already a dozen of biochar projects happening and I will go through some of them now. The first biochar project we've had was a Stockholm biochar project. Uh, initiated already in 2014, where basically the, the city of Stockholm invested in a Pyreg unit that you see on the picture to convert um, garden waste, so mostly woody residues collected from the city and produce district heating, so heat to warm the houses and then also the biochar. And the biochar is being used in an urban environment so in cities, it's what you see in these two pictures on the right, to replant trees because the tree officer of the city realized that trees were dying and that they needed to have more aeration in their, in their soil where the roots are. So that's how they have started to use biochar. And, and this example from Stockholm is now being replicated in other cities in Sweden and I think also in Finland. So garden waste to saving trees in an urban environment. But Stockholm doesn't want to stop there. Um, several stakeholders and mostly Stockholm Exergy, which is a main heating company in, in Stockholm, have plans to upscale uh, to a medium size and a large size. Uh, the medium, medium plant is aiming at 25,000 tons biomass leading to approximately 3,000 tons dry biochar per year. Uh, agreements to build it are in progress but the details about the technology are not yet available and the main application for the char will be still urban environment use so having uh, urban plantings still with biochar. But in a longer time frame the, the city the district heating company is, in, is looking at uh, 60,000 ton per year biochar production. Uh, what I can tell is that research and development has started regarding upscaling of existing reactors and that we have performed for them a prospective life cycle assessment. But then of course, with such a large amount of biochar produced, the, the, the extent that the planned use will not be agriculture, uh, sorry, will not be urban environment only, but also agriculture. And we have looked for them into use in animal husbandry and manure mixing and treatment combined with biochar. Um, then we have also in Sweden farmers that, are, that have invested in pyrolysis equipment, 
This is one example, Lindeborg, not far from Stockholm, where they have a, an organic grain production, but also a hotel and a conference, which require heating in winter. So that's why two years ago, they have bought a Biomacon unit, a 50 kilowatt pyrolysis plant that takes in wood pellets locally sourced and converts it to heat and biochar. And the biochar has started to be used in uh, tree planting on the farm and manure management on the farm. And hoping, we hope that next year, uh, because biochar is now, will now be approved in organic agriculture, will also be used on their arable land. Um, Lindeborg is not the only farm. We have actually three other farms uh, that are doing, doing that. Um, the two first ones have a Biomacon unit, different sizes, and the third one has a modified uh, combustion engine that they have turned into a pyrolysis one. Uh, here, and here I'm showing some of their different motivations. And so the, the first farm really wanted to find an ecological or climate friendly way of heating their buildings. And they heard about biochar through a friend and that's why they, they went for it. While the, the second farmer, he was watching YouTube videos and asked his uh, seed and fertilizer suppliers if they could get some biochar but it was not available on the market at the time, so he decided to produce his own and made an investment. While the last ones were looking into aquaponics and want to have a heat source for their aquaponic farm, and then there was funding available for a pyrosis unit and they went for it in that way. So different motivations, but um, also very interesting projects uh, are happening in the Sweden, on the Swedish countryside. Then if we go to the south of Sweden, we have a, a larger um, company uh, called Skånefru, which is a seed and grass roll producer. So they, grass roll is, you know, these kind of artificial um, or grass roll that you have, for instance, in football stadiums, and they produce these kinds. They, in their facilities, so two Pyreg units, a P500 and a P1500, they take in different types of biomass, so seed uh, waste, grass residues, agricultural straw, and even algae that is collected on the, on the beach, on the coastline. And one of the feature of the installation is that they also provide cadmium removal from the flue gases. Um, and they have a, an interesting research project called Rest to Best, and here's a website that you can visit uh, to get some of their updates as well. And so these were the kind of the pioneers, but now the biochar deployment is expanded, expanding to more um, conventional uh, businesses, uh, construction businesses, and also municipal, municipal waste management companies. And all these that are currently shown on the, on the picture have actually made decisions to invest in production capacity. Uh, so, you may wonder why all of this was possible. And this is mainly because the government has, has made some investments or has given the opportunity to, to fund local emission reductions. That's a program called Climat Clivet. And in the first round of uh, money attribution, they, had, they have funded a dozen of pyrolysis biochar projects. And this year we are expecting a few more to be financed. So as I said, the main manufacturers are Biomacon, Pyreg. Some are developing their own technologies, ex especially the large-scale uh, producers. And we have some of Biogreen and Etia uh, manufacturers as well in, in Sweden. When it comes to use of the biocharts, for now the market is driven by what is happening in, in Stockholm, so tree planting, and also through sales of horticultural soil, so mostly to private persons who want to amend biochar in their, in their garden. But we see hope for the agricultural market to develop and to have more tests being performed in Sweden, because now, um, it, in 2020 at least, we have heard that biochar will be approved in organic agriculture. So we are here on the graph, at the beginning of the biochar production phase in Sweden, but we have already large amounts of capacity that has been or is being built. 
So production will increase and we'll have to follow what use and what, what is being done with biochar. I also point out that the Nordic biochar network uh, for which we are making this map of uh, different projects uh, in Sweden. If you want to appear on the map, uh, you can mail us and we will make sure that you are there as well. So that was it for the overview of the deployment of Biotra in Sweden. Now I would like to, to tell you about my, actually my research, which is life cycle assessment. Yeah. So my job as an industrial ecologist is to study processes, so how humans transform products and energy into different ones that are useful for society, and we also look at their emissions. But we don't uh, simply look at processes individually, we also look at them put together in, in different supply chains. Um, so my role is to define some system boundaries for a biochar project, look at everything that happens in it, but it is in a quantitative manner, of course, but it's also to look at what are the effects of introducing a new technology on the, the surrounding economy, on the broader context. That's what we do, and sometimes it looks like this, some complex databases with several interactions between processes. But if I summarize that and apply that to biochar, um, that's how it looks like. So a biochar system, can always be described by four different steps, four processes. First, we have to produce a biomass, then it's converted in the reactor with some environmental, environmental emissions, and then the, the products of pyrolysis are, are used, so with a biochar in agriculture, for instance, and then the co-products can be chemicals or also fuels. Um, so when we perform, uh, when we perform or produced by HR, we are affecting the surrounding economy. So we affect the state of the markets for biomass and waste biomass. We affect the markets for agriculture and also of various fuels and chemicals and absorbents. And what we are interested in when we perform an LCA is to understand these effects, but also to look at the, the bigger picture, which is the climate system, the land system, and our energy system. So if you want to summarize, my main research question is uh, to answer under what conditions producing biochar and biochar technologies can, are the most environmentally um, suitable. And we are, I'm looking at that in Sweden. And so I want to know when, where, and at what scale we should do biochar or not do. So we apply that, we answer, the, answer these questions through case studies. And I'll walk you through two of my first case studies. The first one is a prospective life cycle assessment of large scale biochar production in, in Stockholm area. Uh, so what happens if we bake a large unit in Stockholm? So this is now published and you have the link here. Uh, the, the basic context is that Stockholm is one of the fastest growing cities in Europe and it has a district heating network that is uh, biomass uh, based. So they achieved to phase out the fossil fuels, but they have ambitious targets and they want to be carbon negative. So the question we have is, should we increase, expand this, the heating system using conventional technologies or should we go for a biochar plant instead? I'll show you a bit what we mean by uh, a biochar system here. So it's first biomass production, where we have uh, residues from the forest that are transported to the city by train, ship, and road. Then we have the biomass conversion step where we're looking at a huge plant and we're not studying the plant in, in isolation from the others. We are looking at also how the energy system in Stockholm will be affected. The energy stock system in Stockholm is based on 40 different units that produce heat. And when you add a new one, the others are affected. So we were, we were studying that in, in detail as well. And then we modeled uh, the biochar use phase um, in agriculture with, uh, as a feed additive to, in dairy farms and also as an additive to the manure storage tanks to reduce some of the climate uh, emissions. 
and then apply it to agriculture to also have look at the carbon storage over time and the effects on nutrients and fertilizer and so on. So when we put all these together, all these pictures together, we get a, a life cycle assessment for which we have measured only the climate impact in that study. And the main outcome of the, the paper is this complex figure with many different scenarios and um, different set of assumptions. But for today, I will just will present one comparison. So the comparison that I have here is between using the same amount of biomass for combustion to produce heat and electricity versus doing pyrolysis of that same biomass where we will get the carbon sequestration, the heat and some electricity, but in different amounts. And so the vertical axis is a climate impact. And the first term you have here, the gray is the cost for transporting and supplying the biomass basically. And that's about 300, it doesn't differ much between the scenarios. But then we have to account for the services provided by our two systems, which are first the energy services. And that's what we depict here. So basically, a combustion plant would produce much more energy and displace the use of uh, more other kind of fuels, well, which makes that the net value for com combustion is so far much better than pyrolysis. But then we need to account also for the, the benefits of the biochar, which are carbon sequestration and agricultural benefits in terms of methane and nitrous oxide emission reductions. And that's what uh, we have here on the diagram. So we add the carbon sequestration and we add the agricultural effects. And so far, we, we see that the biochar plant, in that comparison with our assumptions, does not outperform the combustion combustion plant. But when, we, when you look at a life cycle assessment study, you must always be careful and try to understand the results. What parameters are controlling the results and what assumptions have we made giving that conclusion? Mm -hmm. And here I want to highlight two points. First, the energy penalty. What is controlling it? Because pyrolysis produces less energy than combustion, but the climate impact of it is scaled by what fuel you have in your city. And then, are we certain about the biochar effect in agriculture? Now, two points I want to raise. So here is a dynamic figure, the one you've just seen, and I'm going to change our assumption about the electricity source in, in the city of Stockholm. And the time frame of 2020, if I increase and go in time and look into the future where we have a um, very decarbonized electricity system, then the picture is totally different. Compare it again, that's if you have a fossil electricity source and that's if you have a very uh, rather decarbonized one. And then in that case, the biochar, the pyrolysis scenario, largely in a way beats the combustion scenario. So, uh -huh. background energy Very good. is Very good. important. And regarding the agricultural effects, our modeling was exploratory. Uh, we have worked with IPCC emission factors and assumed reductions based on, the, on various meta analysis, but they are quite uncertain. Uh, one of the main results is that uh, if you use your biochar efficiently, you get carbon sequestration, but you can also double the benefits through various effects with methane and nitrous oxide reductions. And we should aim for being in that scenario on the right here. So at best doubling the benefits through an efficient use phase or an efficient use of the charcoal. So if we summarize the results of the first paper is that the performance and the suitability of doing biochar at large scale depends on the background energy system you have and the performance of the biochar in the field. So that was for the first case. Now let's look at the second case study, which was small scale biochar production on Swedish farms. We are working with the farmers directly and we organized various work workshops at their, at their place to spread the knowledge. And we also presented uh, the results at the, at the biochar conference in Italy. Um, so Lindeborg, I already introduced them earlier. 
Um, so a key feature is that in their system, the biochar is a co-product of the heating. If they don't need heat, they don't produce biochar. So the question we had for them was, in, if we assume an energy efficient uh, biochar production, so that we don't dump the heat just because we want biochar, how much can they produce? And then we were also interested in comparing this heating technology with other heating technologies that they could uh, invest in, which are like heat pumps or electrical heating or conventional combustion ones. So for that, we have developed a complex model, an energy system modeling tool that is also combined with a life cycle assessment. I'm not explaining more about it, but I would just want to say that it's written in Python and that it will be publicly available for other researchers to use or even for consultants to make uh, feasibility studies of, for other farms, for instance. And we, we can play with this model and ask different questions. And here are the three questions we are asking. So how much biochar can be produced? What are the environmental impacts of these heating technologies? And also, can we make scenarios and look into the future? How can we increase biochar production on the farm? So I'll go through each of these simulations. And when it comes to biochar production, so what we did was to take all the temperature series we had available for the past 20 years, but also look into the future and include the impact of climate change in Sweden, which will reduce the need for heating. And then we run our model on a daily basis and look every year how much biochar can be produced on the farm. And that's what we have here on this axis, the biochar production as a function of the heat demand. And we see that there is a quite, quite large spread actually between the very cold winters where they produce up to 10 tons and the very warm winter they will, where they will produce about two, two or three tons of biochar. And when we add then the effects of climate change and look and try to look into the future, we see that the production mostly goes down and the average, the average production goes down by 30%. That's quite a significant amount. So the main takeaway is that if you are a small scale biochar producer, you will have an interannual variability of your production. And in Sweden, at least, we will have a long-term decreasing trend. We, we've also shown that the sizing of your installation really matters. Uh, if you want to be less sensitive to future climate change, you have to take into account and adapt the size of the plant you, you buy. You're more sensitive if you have an oversized uh, unit. Then when it comes to the environmental impacts, so the life cycle part of uh, our study, we were comparing a different way of heating uh, the farm uh, and provide one year of heating. The life cycle includes manufacturing the plant, producing the fuels, looks at the emissions during the use of the plants and also the electricity consumption. And we include also the carbon sequestration, so the benefits of producing the biochar. And that's the climate impact. So now the axis is horizontal, the positive or emissions and the negatives are the carbon sequestration terms, the biochar. The first scenario, three ones are pyrolysis and the other three ones are more references so combustion of uh, wood pellets, heat pumps, or just electrical heating. And so we see that the pyrolysis have a clear advantage. They are in a way net negative. They sequester more than they emit. But we also see that the emissions, if we just look at the positive part, they are higher than what it was for the, what it would be for conventional systems. Um, here we also looked at not only the climate impact, but other impact categories like land use. And basically land use doubles when you are using pyrolysis compared to the other heating techniques. And also at uh, some health effects, and they are usually higher for pyrolysis scenarios. But this is not a surprise. Um, and it means that biochar carbon sequestration comes at an environmental cost. And this cost is the increased consumption of biomass because for the same heating service, you will use the double amount of wood, basically. Um, these results are also dependent on the electricity mix you have in the country. And here we have worked with the average Swedish electricity, which is rather decarbonized. 
Um, and um, it, these results stress that you must not just produce biochar for carbon sequestration, but you have to use it in an efficient way. And that will mitigate these uh, negative effects here, or these increased effects compared to reference technologies. And finally, the third simulation was to look at what options did the farm have had to grow and to increase its production. The only thing I want to say here is that the, the tool we have can be used to make scenarios and so discuss with the farmers their, their projects and their ideas and, and then give them feedback on what it means for the installation in their biochar system. That's an option we, we are we are using when we, we meet with the farmers, we listen to what they suggest and then we try to model it for them and give them some quantitative insights. So that's more on the applied part of the research. So main conclusion of that case, a tool was developed and we hope that it will be reused by consultants and researchers. Carbon sequestration through biochar comes at an environmental cost, which is increased consumption of biomass. And it's very important to use your char in an efficient way so that you get extra benefits. Um, and, but, but overall, the climate, uh, the heating system that at least achieved the net carbon dioxide removal, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the entire farm activities were climate neutral. Their, their use of diesel for farming the land is still much bigger than what they sequester by producing the biochar. So there's still some work to do. So, Last slide is about um, yeah, my PhD conclusions so far, nothing new. Our study confirmed that uh, biochar and carbon dioxide removal means increasing the material and energy uh, consumption of our economy. And that for it to be suitable, we need to have decarbonized energy system and look for tangible agricultural benefits. In Sweden, as we've seen, there is a there are interesting opportunities to produce biochar at various scales. And this is linked to the fact that we are, I mean, in Sweden, there is a large amount of biomass available and the energy system is already rather clean or decarbonized. Use phase is still emerging and need to be more documented and re researched on. And I put that quote again from the IPCC report that remembers us that we need to be coherent. If we advocate for biochar production and carbon sinks, we also need to work with reducing energy demand, reducing material consumption, and changing, here they mentioned diet, for instance. So that was it for me. Um, here are my contact information. And I like to make always a call that we need more data and collaboration on open source tools and softwares if we want Biochar to be uh, to be part of the the future and that industry take it up.